studio tour, studio tour with Kevin Sloan. And March 23rd, we'll have another Zoom with Crystal Bridges. And this time we will be um, viewing their art with a, a guide. And just along with that, I want to let you know, those of you that are here today, we will be doing, a, you'll be getting a, a, an email about a trip coming up at the end of April to Crystal Bridges. And it'll probably be a two night trip, but you can extend it if you like. We'll be touring the architecture, the grounds, um, the art. It should be quite exciting. But when you get your email, we'll need to know if you have interest so that we know whether to pursue this. Um, but we're hoping it'll be a fairly inexpensive trip. The, the flights are inexpensive in the 200 to $300 range. The hotel on the grounds will be not very expensive. And so take a look at it and hopefully join us. And then along today's lines, if you have a question as the presentation is going forward, go ahead and put it in the chat, or if you feel comfortable, unmute yourself and go right ahead and ask Deborah. She's willing to answer your questions as we go. So with that, Phyllis, do you wanna do our introductions for us? I will, it's a pleasure. A native of Colorado, Deborah Jordy has played a prominent role on the arts and cultural scene for over 30 years. Ms. Jordy joined SCFD in December, 2016. Since 1989, SCFD has distributed funds from a one-tenth of 1% 1 sales and use tax to cultural facilities throughout the seven county Denver, Colorado metropolitan area. The funds support cultural facilities whose primary purpose is for enlightening and entertaining the public. $64 million was allocated to approximately 300 eligible scientific and cultural organizations in 2020. Prior to joining SCFD, Deborah served as executive director of the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, a nonprofit membership organization of Colorado businesses whose mission is to leverage the arts for economic vitality. Earlier in her career, she served as executive director of the Arvada Center for the Arts and Humanities and led the, and led the Cherokee Ranch and Cancel Castle Foundation. She also served as Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art for the Denver Art Museum. She is a trustee of the Bonfi Stanton Foundation and on the Board of Directors of the Americas for the Arts. Deborah frequently gives presentations regarding the arts and economic development to local, national, and international audiences in 2014, Deborah received the Dan Key Award from the Denver Art Museum. So welcome, Deborah. We're so pleased you're joining us. Well, thank you. And, and Phyllis, it's so good to see you. Phyllis and I go way back. Um, I need to update my bio because I actually, I think I started my Denver Art Museum career but prior to being a, a curator of modern contemporary art. I worked as an assistant exhibition designer and that's when I was in my late, well, mid to late 20s. So I need to add another decade to that bio. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> but anyway. anyway. Um, and it's wonderful to see many of you all and to meet some new people. So yeah, as I said, it'll do, I'll do a run through the slides and please ask questions either in the chat or, or just jump in and ask me. Um, Good. And I forgot to tell you all, I am recording this and then it goes on our website. So Great. several people have written me that they couldn't do it. And was it recorded? And I said, yes, it is. All right, so we'll begin the slides. There we are. We, we yeah. are, you know, we are the SDFD. We fund culture. That's the whole motto of what we do is to fund culture and for the organizations to provide access to the public. Next, please. Uh, 
hold on here. There we go. So it's interesting when you think back to the creation of the SCFD and um, we, you know, we were in a recession in the mid eighties, nothing like we have been faced with now, but it was a dark time. You know, so much of the uh, commerce and industry in, in the seven counties area was based in oil and gas. We've really diversified our economy since, but at that time, we felt uh, the arts and cultural sector was hard hit by the recession. You know, at that time I was at the art museum and Phyllis was there and many of you all were involved with the museum. And, you know, we were talking about closing galleries, closing for certain days, light items for the Museum of Nature and Science, the zoo, Botanic Gardens and Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They had money, they were getting money from the state and the city and both said, we're gonna have to cut this out. So that's when really, key individuals, trustees of predominantly at that point, the tier ones came together. Next, please. I found some great slides. I'm really excited about this one. So this is a slide of Rex Morgan, Rex and Caroline Morgan. And I think the woman with the dark curly hair is Tina Poe, who was one of the former directors of the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. But I show this slide because there were key trustees at the Art Museum, the Zoo, Botanic Gardens, and Museum of Nature and Science. And Rex Morgan, whom I had the pleasure of knowing really well, as well as Caroline, because she was a docent in the modern contemporary department. I saw them a lot. We traveled on trips together. I got to know him well. He, he started thinking about what could he do along with others to boost the arts. Um, and, and it wasn't going to be from corporate. It wasn't going to be from, from cities and counties at that time. So he had, he along with Ed Connors, a trustee at the um, uh, Denver Botanic Gardens and others, Bruce Benson, uh, Julie Smith, who was very involved with the Art Museum along with Morgan Smith, came together and started talking about uh, what kind of public taxing mechanism could be put in place. And at the time, the only other tax was a tax that's still in place in St. Louis. And it's the it's the arts and it's the museum and zoological tax. It has as bad a name as we do, the scientific and cultural facilities tax. They're really got great names, but anyway. So um, they looked at that model and it funds only five organizations. There are five big organizations. Well, Rex looked at that and independently, it's a funny story, Rex along with a few other art museum trustees, Ed along with some Botanic Gardens trustees and others were thinking about this. Well, it just happened that there was this trip to Egypt on the Nile. Several of them were on it. And so as lore goes, they kind of cooked it up there. But there is a, quite a bit of truth to that. Anyway, they came back, they started working with legislators that would sponsor the bill. It died in committee in 1985 because there was too much fighting. There was fighting amongst the tier ones, there was fighting amongst the, some of the tier twos, the symphony, ballet, Arvada Center wanted to come and expand it. Ultimately, things worked out. It was developed that there would be three tiers, tier one being the big five international and nationally recognized organizations, tier two, which at the time was seven or eight organizations, and tier three, um, tier two being the regional organizations and the tier three being the small, more grassroots, local county-based organizations. Anyway, it came together and it was passed in legislation. Uh, next slide, please. Passed out of committee and it was, oh, sorry, can we go back one? It was signed in, um, into law. Oh, I'm sorry, one more, please. That's, oh, uh, that's okay. It, it, uh, voters approved it uh, at 67%, which is a very high margin in 1988. And, there we go. Yep. And that Roy Romer, Governor Romer, Rex Morgan in the middle, and Frederick Mayer, who was the chairman of the board at the Art Museum at the time, the bill was signed into law. And the SCFD was off and running. You know, I hate to do this. I'm going to have to let somebody in my house. I am so sorry. Can I do that? Of course. I'll be, I'll be right back. Sorry. Uh, that's interesting that Fred was the, um, Fred. Fred Mayer. 
Yes. Uh, is that Fred Mayer there? Yeah. Yes. Oh. And Rex. Oh yeah, Rex. Yeah, and uh, Roy. Oh, I am so sorry. I this is the problem of working at home. Um, <laughs> no so, problem. Uh, yeah, it's just I got somebody working here, and it's like they would show up right when we start talking. <laughs> um, so it was signed into law, and it was amazing. It was all the the counties, um, and um, we were off and running. Um, I've got to give Frederick and Jan Mayer and, and, and the Vander Arks and so many people that I was closely involved with credit. We were making these two penny pins uh, and plastering them everywhere. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a time. Next, please. So, you know, we think about the times then, and, and obviously with COVID, it's so extreme, but Colorado and specifically Metro Denver has really diversified. And so we've diversified our economy. We have established some very large collaborative networks, SCFD being one. Um, SCFD was modeled on the RTD footprint, the six counties at the time. But at the same time in the late eighties, we saw a lot of regional cooperation. So the Denver Metro Chamber was really reaching out broadly. The Metro Mayor's Caucus was established, the Stadium District, and these were all regional developments. And I still think to this day, it's one thing that makes our region special and important is that there's a lot of cooperation amongst um, business, civic, and arts leaders, which I think is really unique. And, and you don't always see it in other communities our size. Next, please. So, you know, all grown up. When you think about what has changed, we started with six counties in 89. We're now seven, that includes Broomfield now. The population is all, almost doubled from 1.8 to 3.2. Um, we will be a minority majority city in a few years too. Um, we have grown exponentially from, you know, below 130s to over 300. I think we're at about 320 organizations currently. And it's staggering to think uh, that SCFD supports that many organizations. And the first year of distributions of the funds and grants was only 14 million. And last year we distributed $64 million. Um, I should say that, you know, we are the envy of the country. There are other cities that have some uh, arts tax, but nothing like what we have. Uh, Tacoma, Seattle, Cleveland, St. Louis, uh, and other cities and counties have taxes, but a lot of them are tied to a hotel tax um, or a, a, yeah, a lodger's tax. So um, I talk to a lot of people around the country. And if you ever talk to friends or colleagues around the country that are interested in it, I'm happy to talk to anyone because the more communities that can establish something like, uh, like SCFD, I think the better. So I always put that out there. Um, and we'll get into it in a minute, but we're on track to, to distribute a lot of, well, we close out our 2021 20, year, the end of February, and we're on track to have it be the highest year ever, even in a pandemic. Next, please. It's important to keep in mind that, again, thinking about us as a national model, we're the only tax, uh, arts cultural tax district that's multi-county. Cleveland is just the city of Cleveland, as is Salt Lake and, and Tacoma. But again, we've got seven counties and very diverse populations, very diverse interests between Boulder, Douglas County, Adams, Jeffco. And, and it's really great to see the way large and small organizations work together and that residents you know, see the value in this. And I always go back, what's most important in this is that the money is collected for the organizations, but it's for you and all the residents to enjoy because you're paying the tax. And so I'm always continuing to thank the residents for supporting the tax because it's the people that make it happen. Next, please. So you all know it's one penny on every $10, which really adds up. Um, just for example, in Salt Lake, they distribute about 15 million 
Cleveland's tax is a restive tax. It's a cigarette tax. So we're glad they're not smoking, but we're sorry more money's not going to the arts. And uh, they distribute about $14, $14 million. Um, St. Louis is larger than we are, but again, it only supports five organizations. So I would say, how would you feel if you're running a ballet or a small theater company and you know, those big organizations are getting all the money. It's, it's in my mind, and I, would, I have said this to them, it's not as equitable as the way we look at ours. And every time reauthorization comes, we, we tweak it a little bit to be more equitable, <coughs> excuse me, across the board. Next, please. Structure is pretty simple. We have a board of directors of 11 people. We have one board member from each county and th those board members are either elected in Denver and in Broomfield by the city and county by their um, city council. In Jeffco, Adams, Rapho, and the others, they are appointed by their, I'm sorry, they're not elected. They, they're appointed by their, um, their county commissioners. So again, it gets to the beauty of this is about local control. So people in each county that are paying tax have at some level some say in, in who's on the board. And then when we get to tier three, more of, of how tier three dollars are being distributed. Then we have four uh, uh, gubernatorial appointees and um, they are appointed by the governor. Um, all of our board members can serve up to two six year terms. And we have a fabulous board right now. There's just amazing people. Um, we have seven county cultural councils, one for each county. And that's kind of a fancy name for grant review panels. And again, these are residents of those counties that apply through their county to serve. Um, they can serve, it varies from county to county, two and three year terms. They can do a couple terms. And what they do is they review the tier three grants and make the funding decisions on those grants of those home county organizations, as well as organizations that are applying. And they, they, they make, make the decisions on the funding of the money that comes directly from those county proportion, their proportionate share of the tier three funds. So for example, in Denver, given the large number of tier three organizations, uh, their distribution is about 2 million a year. So it's a sizable amount of money that those individuals are making decisions on. And the beauty of the cultural councils is that they, they, can, they can make decisions about, uh, about thing, uh, organizations in their community. So it's much more sort of homegrown and grass tops approach, which I think is great. Um, so if you ever know anyone that would be interested in it, that lives in one of the counties that you think might be interested in serving on a cultural council, they can go to their the city and county in Denver, it's the arts and venues department or in say Jeffco, it's through the county commissioners and apply. We're always looking for people uh, to do this work. It's, it's time consuming because you have to read a lot of grants but you really learn about the smaller organizations in your community and it's, it's a good thing. Um, okay. Yeah, but let me ask you how, so I live in Denver, how hard is it to get appointed to one of these? You know, I mean, again, we don't make the decisions. The, in Denver, they have a, I think it's a 10 member council right now. And the council members vote on the applications. So they make the decisions. You know, how I think it depends on one, in a year, how many openings there are. And if they're looking for different skill sets. So I would say, if you're interested, let me know. And I can put you in touch with the, in some cases, the, the county liaison. Some have, some have staff and others, it's a little more general, but just let me know if there's, if you'd like to know more and I can put you in touch with them. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a tiny little staff there. I have five staff members <laughs> and half of them are out with COVID. It's like, oh, well, no. <laughs> um, but you know, what's important in that is that I always say we're, it's lean government because we are a division of local government, we're different because we have our own board, we're autonomous in some ways, but we do fall in state, we are, we are agent of, of state government. Um, and, but we have a very small staff and that's really, uh, in future years, I hope it's larger, but uh, we have a small staff because 
the way the law is written, 98.5% of all the money, I'm close this, they're banging, 98.5% of the total funds we send out goes out to all the organizations. We run SCFD on 1.5, excuse me, percent of the revenue. So I run SCFD on about a million dollars a year with three grant officers. So we're busy and it's good. Um, and, and we have a great team, but that's sort of the, that's the structure because we really believe and the way the law is that it's important that the funds go to the organizations. So I hope that kind of makes sense um, there. Next, please. Um, as you all know, and I mentioned that there are three tiers. There, there, there's tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one are the large international national organizations, the Zoo, Botanic Gardens, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Art Museum, and the DCPA. The DCPA wasn't initially in the uh, tier ones. They came in during the reauthorization in 2000, or excuse me, uh, uh, 1994. Um, and they receive, it, all the funding is sort of set in statute. The tier ones receive uh, currently, um, it's a bifurcated system. So they receive between 64 and 57% of the total revenue collected. The tier twos, you know, as I said, started off with only under a dozen and now it's grown to 32. So for example, in tier two, it's regional. You have the Pace Center in, in, um, in Parker, Lone Tree Arts Center, uh, the Arvada Center, um, Aurora Col uh, Municipal Arts Services, the Colorado Ballet, Central City Opera, Opera Colorado, um, and many, and Children's Museum, Art Students League, many more. And some of these started off in tier three. Some, most of them started off in tier two, but many have, many, well, many have come in to tier two, like the Art Students League. Um, the way it's structured is to qualify, first, all the organizations have to go through an eligibility process. And we do that every year with the tier, the new tier threes. But once you're in, you're sort of in. And then with tier two, we base their funding on a formula and it's based on their annual attendance and their operating income. So tier two funding on the low side, say for some an organization like E-Town in Boulder, where they do the wonderful performances and uh, radio shows, receives probably around $500,000 a year based on their numbers. Whereas the Children's Museum or Arvada Center could receive up to $2 million a year. So again, it depends on, it's, it's based on the formula. Um, and it's a lot of organizations that have come into that group. Tier three is huge. <laughs> we have about 280 small organizations. And I say small and they vary in size from all volunteer to uh, larger tier threes like Curious Theater, who has a professional staff and larger budgets. But to be in tier, and I don't want to bore you with the details, but to be in tier um, two, you have to have a budget of at least 1.7 million. So the tier threes are great because they're really serving neighborhoods and communities. We have over, I think, 40 choral groups. Who knew? Everybody's singing, which is great. I mean, it's, it's very wonderful. And it's, uh, it continues to grow. One thing I didn't know, and I've worked with SCFD forever, but until I went to SCFD, I didn't realize that every year organizations apply and we always find organizations eligible to come into tier three. So it's a great way for organizations to get in to receive you know, good stable funding. And I think that's the beauty of SCFD is that it's, it's been consistent funding for over 30 years. You don't know exactly what you're gonna get really because it's tax and I can't tell you what people are gonna spend. We do a lot of modeling but it's consistent funding where you, they're not at the whim of a, I shouldn't say this, I'm on foundation, so I know this, but if of a, of a foundation sh shifting their giving, you know, say we're gonna go, and we saw a lot of that during COVID, shift from arts to human service or education. So it's, it's, it's a very stable funding mechanism for our organization. 
And, and I would say the one thing it's really produced or helped to not produce, but enhance is that we in the metro area, I use the boxing metaphor, punch way above our weight and have so many more culturals, a large in part to the SCFD. It's also helped to stabilize them, to help the larger organizations to create endowments. You can't use SCFD money for endowments, but then be able to use other funds for endowments to just create longer term stability. Next, please. And ask questions. I can just keep talking and I don't want to bore you all to death. So just please ask questions. Um, Deborah, there was a comment made when you were talking about the work that was done oh. um, in the in those committees. Um, Sorry, Sharon, look at Sharon Rouse yeah. served for the Arapaho County for over five years and said it right. was very, very rewarding work. Thank you, Sharon. I'm sorry. Sometimes when I'm talking, I don't look at the chat, but you're right. Yeah. I mean, Sharon, do you want to comment on that? Is there anything you'd like to tell the group about? Um, just a second. I'll, um, I'll get my video going too. So I'm a person. <laughs> Okay, no, it's disappearing. Yeah, we're just listening. Okay, there we go. Anyway, um, I heard about it from a neighbor who was on the SCFD Arapahoe County one, and she encouraged, kept encouraging me to apply because when somebody is asking, how do you get on? And I applied and um, didn't hear and didn't hear because of the county commissioners and then found out I was accepted. And, um, <laughs> The first couple of meetings, high learning curve as to the experiences the people on this committee have been through. And the committee is, was incredibly diverse mm -hmm. with their backgrounds, their interests, uh, the parts of Arapahoe County they were from. And I think probably two things I learned off of it. Well, I learned a lot, but I mean, two certain things. One, I did not realize how diverse Arapahoe County was and where the money went. Some of the money went to fund musical instruments for mm -hmm. a school district. There is a small, small acting organization that's very much like family, but it's a, it's a smaller one. There is a school for Indian dancers, India dance. I mean, the right. things that I, we kept getting requests from, and some of it could be for $500, some of it could be for $125,000. But the grants, the last year that I was on the board, um, as I had done two terms, um, we looked at 94 grants, which is a lot of reading and a lot of meetings to go through, but the things that you learn and the things that you see, um, I am so glad my neighbor kept nagging at me mm -hmm. until I, I signed up for it because now I feel like I've contributed to Arapahoe County. Yes, it's a huge contribution, thank you. And you do, you learn so much about these amazing organizations. I don't know if you were referencing Mudra Dance. It's a yeah. East Indian dance company that does, incredible work and it's just it's it's really funny it's a lot of work but it's really rewarding and i apologize for the noise i'm having work done in my house and my neighbor's dogs barking <laughs> so, it's working at home um so anyway thank you for the opportunity oh you're welcome but that's the beauty again of tier three that there are just the coolest most interesting organizations to to experience and we try to, um, maybe there's a way I can send this to you. Every, I do a lot with the state legislature just to make sure they're aware of who we are, see the value in it. And it's not just legislators in the seven counties, but it's statewide because I really, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about the next reauthorization and how to make sure everyone sees the value in this. Um, I never take SCFD for granted, never, ever, ever. So we do an email every Wednesday called Wednesday Wonders. It's kind of a cute little name that we send to legislators. And it's a short video and one of these facts just to keep us top of mind. So if you all would like those, just let Helen know and I'd be happy to send them to you. Uh, again, it just shows the diversity of organizations in SCFD. Um, a little bit about what's gone on in the pandemic. You know, it was really rough March 13th when everything closed for everybody. And uh, I just have spent the last two years, as I do, on the phone talking or Zooming with organizations. 
we have lost only one organization due to the pandemic. And that was in part because the founder um, was ill, he's recovering, but he was also in his 80s and there wasn't a big secession plan. So I feel very lucky that the organizations have survived. Um, it's been rough, a lot of stimulus money helped. SCFD, I mean, they, they will all say it saved us. And it's thanks to you all buying things and keeping our economy going that, that made it happen. You know, $63 million, that's a lot of money uh, to, to, um, to invest in the arts. To put it in comparison, if you were to look at us as, a, as we are a funder, but when you think about private funding, community funding, the, the Colorado Health Foundation is the largest foundation. They, they fund between 80 and 100 uh, million a year. The Anschutz Foundation follows in the 70s, 80s and 90s and we're at 63 million. We, I will not repeat this publicly, but I will say it to you all, we're on track to probably distribute over $70 million when we true up things in February, which is extraordinary to think that in this economy, you are contributing and we're able to, to keep the arts going. So I think it's quite amazing. Next please. Deborah, can I just ask, add something? There's a comment made in the chat. Oh, sorry, um, I, gotta look, I gotta get my chat open, sorry. No, no worries. I'll let you know when it comes through, but okay. this person wanting to increase the levy because the zoo really needs funds and has been starved for them. Can you just speak a little bit about the idea of increasing that levy? Um, I would say, you know, nothing will happen uh, uh, until um, much later. So SCFD will sunset in 2030, which means that it, we reach a point where we'll have to go back for reauthorization. Traditionally, our board makes the decision to go to the public, to vote of the public two years before we sunset. So for example, you know, it was approved in 1988 originally. It was then reauthorized in, two, in 1994, then in 2004, and then 2016, sunsets in 2018. So the board will probably, and they, my board hasn't made that decision yet. That's their decision to go back in 2028. At that time, prior to that, we will be doing an extensive process uh, like during every reauthorization to assess the mill levy, to assess the amounts, the percentages going to the tiers, to assess a lot of things, just look at it. And I should add, you know, the beauty I think of SCFD is Salt Lake, or excuse me, um, St. Louis taxes in perpetuity, it's a property tax, which is great, it never changes, they get a lot of money, but you know, ours comes up every 20 years and I actually, around every 20 years. I think that's important because the world is changing. We have a much more diverse community. We have a much stronger, we will have a much stronger shifts in demographics. Denver's gonna look, Denver, Metro Denver's gonna look different. And I think we factor all that into it. We also have so many organizations. I would say, um, on increasing the levy, you know, that's always, that's always a challenge because SCFD isn't a new tax. It's an existing tax. And it's hard to determine in, climate, in the right climate when you can increase the tax. So just know, Betty, we're always thinking about reauthorization and analyzing what that will look like. Um, we've got some time to really study it. Now, all the organizations need help. I mean, the zoo had a really rough time. It was very, very tough. I was talking to them constantly because not only do they have to pay their staff, but they've got to feed the animals. You know, I don't minimize any museum or performing arts group because it's been a struggle for everybody, especially performing arts. But the zoo had a, you know, had a really rough time um, because, you know, their, their operational costs are so high, really high. You can't just, you know, it's like the museum, you can, art museum, you can have a skeletal security crew. I mean, Christoph might not totally agree, but you can minimize your losses in a museum greater than in a zoo. So it's a, it was a big challenge, it still is. But people are coming back. And the beauty with the zoo, at least they could be outside and people could go and it, was, it stayed open more than others. Um, 
And again, this, these are earlier numbers, but we see over 15,000 people attending arts and culture. And part of that is that the, the art museum, not the museum, the organizations do an excellent job at working with us on offering free and reduced programming because we need to make sure that arts and culture are, are as accessible to all of our res residents. And everyone has a, offer, has a chance to really engage and participate. And for our children to know that arts and culture and science are a part of their world. So when I see this, you know, 15 million number, it's really important. Now that includes tourists and others, but residents re repeatedly go to free days, go to reduced programming, go to exhibitions because they see the value in it. Next, please. Um, you all, you know, when I think about the volunteer hours, it's extraordinary. And this again is from the C C CBCA study two years ago. Um, so they've gone down obviously with, with the pandemic, but uh, volunteers play a huge role in staffing and volunteering for, for organizations. And I just applaud you all for your work that you do for SCFD and for the organizations, because again, we see in this community a very uh, volunteer driven um, community. And I just wanna thank you for that. Next, please. Um, this is really important because, you know, the, the organization, we don't fund arts education. We fund a couple organizations that specifically do, and we don't fund schools. It's in the statute. We don't fund libraries, schools, broadcast, broadcasting. Um, but all the organizations know the value and um, know the value and the importance of educating our children. So whether it's a dance class at the Arvada Center or a painting class or or Bluff Lake um, Bird Conservatory. There's just so many things that the schools know that they're connected. And so our organizations work very closely with the schools in normal times for field trips and outings. And we're gonna get back to that. Um, one thing I think that's been particularly enlightening during the pandemic is how many of our organizations were able to switch to online programming and do virtual programming. And I've talked to so many educators in public schools, private schools, charter schools, that they really have, have welcomed uh, both a relief for their teachers and a respite for the kids, whether it was a music class or a painting class for, for them. So kudos to the organizations who, you know, like on a dime by, from March to June of 2020, they already had some programs up and going and it was just great. It's changed the model for some organizations that will continue to do hybrid programs and in person. But again, the importance of making sure all school districts are uh, involved with the organizations is, is really key to what we do and key to the future. So Deborah, uh, like we drive by the Botanic Gardens and there is a busload of students going in yeah. or down at the, um, uh, in the theaters, you know, the performing arts, is that this SCFD funded organizations? Um, it depends, you know, it varies a lot. Um, it, some of it is, I mean, some of it, the beauty of SCFD funds to any of our organizations, well, specific, specifically tier one and tier two, it's all general operating support. So they can use the money as they see fit. They can pay salaries, they can use it for buses to get you know, because transportation costs are one of the biggest hurdles for uh, school trips. It's timing for kids right now, but it's also um, the transportation. So, so a lot of the organizations, Botanic Gardens, I know, they'll pay for the, the buses to get the kids there. They also, Botanic Gardens also pays for buses to go up and get residents to come down. Um, so just, it, it's, it varies, Helen. Okay. Um, that may be the last slide, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, I think that yeah. is. It is, it is. Um, you know, I just, it's just an extraordinary uh, thing we have. It's the it we have in our community that keeps arts and culture humming. And I think it's so important because it represents, we work with 
small multicultural BIPOC organizations. We work with the art museum. We work with, you know, everybody. And, and it's just, you know, it's a treasure. And, you know, I guess my ask to you all would be to keep talking about the value it has for you as an individual, for your family, for your, for your kids, for your grandkids and your neighbors, and encourage people just, just so they know what it is. Um, I'll be doing a lot more in the coming years just to continue and message SCFD. And, and I just thank you for letting me be with you all today. I'm, um, it's fun to see everybody. And Phyllis, I gotta say, and, and Nancy's on the call now. I see Nancy Benson's on. Yeah, she's on. Yeah, Nancy, I don't see your face, but I know you're there, Nancy. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really something. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Deborah, I have, I have one. Um, I am wondering, since Boulder and Broomfield are a part of, of the organization now, were they, were there any organizations that are funded through SCFD? Um, impacted by the Marshall Fire? Not that we're aware of. We've been in close contact with the City of Boulder's Arts and Culture um, Office. We've talked to many of our organizations. Um, our board member from Broomfield, Suzanne Crawford, runs a human service education, or excuse me, a human service nonprofit up there. And so she's kind of on the ground and we're not aware. We're not aware of anyone. We, there, there may be some people that worked in organizations but we're not aware of anyone. Mm -hmm. We're keeping close tabs on it. We sent a message out right away that if anyone needs our help or, or whatever, we're, we're there for them. Uh, my question was, I thought it was so interesting at the beginning of your lecture, when you were saying how we really are uh, leading the country mm -hmm. in this. Did Rex Morgan and Fred and Romer Roy, come up with this theory of the one cent for every ten dollars. Yeah. How did that happen, and why? Why are we leading it? I mean, well, partially it was because you know things were pretty grim in the mid '80s, and you know funding was leaving. And I just remember the art museum was saying, "Am I going to still have a job?" But it wasn't that bad. But cutting down, you know, cutting days, cutting exhibitions. You know, and I think they really looked at the um, St. Louis model, and it was a group of very forward-thinking, innovative people. You know, Rex and 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 Drew Fred. Smith and Fred and Barry or Hirschfeld and Nancy's on the call. I mean, so many people were trying to figure it out, and they did. I mean, it's people are still around the country just amazed. You know, I talked to groups, I was in uh, pre-pandemic, I was in Charlotte. I talked to a group in, in um, uh, Indianapolis, you know, and, and San Francisco. And part of it, I think it was amazing. It, it also was amazing that it passed at a time when we were just coming out or going through a recession. But again, the residents of our region see value in arts and culture, you know? And they keep, they keep seeing that and we keep passing it. As I understand it, it passes usually by more than 70%? Not quite that high. It passes usually, it, well, it depends on the county. When you aggregate oh. them, it's usually between 67 and 63%. Mm -hmm. um, Douglas and Adams are usually lower, um, but it varies. You know, it's always over. It's never been too skinny that we've gotten really, really worried. But as I said, I never take any of this for granted. Um, the other thing is that, you know, tax changes and we're in a time where I think legislators are looking very closely on how to help small business, the hotel and tourism industry, the issues with crime. It's gonna be an interesting session. I don't, nothing's in jeopardy and we're not gonna do anything in this session, I, I just monitor and make sure that um, I know what's going on and keep my eye on things. But um, I'm just saying, you know, it's a challenging time. Um, and I'm really glad we're not up for reauthorization right now. Yeah. Uh, anybody can ask a question, just unmute yeah. yourself if you want to do that. 
And I can I ask you, it said it sunsets in 2030. What what happens at that point? It goes it goes away. So that's why every you know, that's why we've got to go back to the voters and say, OK, do you want this again? And and at that time, we determine, you know, our I work with our 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 internal leaders, our staff, our board, uh, the community, uh, determining what the statute would look like. We legislative council committees, sponsors, all of that. So again, you know, St. Louis is they don't go back and vote, but every year, every reauthorization, ours gets changed slightly, which I think is a good thing, as I said, because our community is changing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking of Fred Mayer, yesterday, uh, Tuesday, we just had an excellent visit to the Red House. Oh, isn't it spectacular? Uh, it was just spectacular with Ann Daly, you know, oh, yeah. us around. those yeah. are the kind of things that Matt About Art does. Let's see, are we in line to receive some money? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tier three. <laughs> well, you know, we do get a lot of re requests from organizations um, that would like to be part of SCFD, and especially in the science side of things, because we do fund a natural science. We said we fund science, but um, but we do not fund research science. It's it, the, our our mantra, and it's in the statute is. The organizations have to demonstrate how they engage and enlighten the public. That's my, that's my holy grail. So I don't think I'm sorry. You're enlightening. No, well, I don't know. I'm very enlightening. But you're <laughs> um, a great group of women. I think it's all women on the call. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, whoops. Um, and and uh, but it's you know it's not for clubs. It's not for member. Not just strictly membership organizations. Yeah. No, that was, that was, a I joke. know. Oh, I know. That was a joke. Yeah. But you know, we do have on our website, a lot of great information. And one thing we have on there, if you ever hear of an organization that's interested in SCFD, they can go to the eligibility section and we have a quiz mm. and they can take the quiz and see if they, if they meet the quiz, if they pass the quiz, then they can contact us. So it's based on what some of the criteria is. Very interesting. Uh, Phyllis, do you have any questions? No, not, not right now, thanks. It was uh, really, really wonderfully informative, Deborah. I often wondered about this. And so uh, this will be on our website. Your talk will be, it, just, uh, it was just wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, you yes. are so welcome. Just love seeing yes, you Thank all. you, Deborah. Thank you, Appreciate Phyllis. It. So good to see you. Tell Gary hi for me. I will. He's sitting here. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Very. Yeah, and, you know, for me, if there's one thing, just continue, if, if appropriate, to make sure that everyone you know knows the value of SCFD. We can't talk about it enough because it's a gift. It's yes. A gift. It's, it's, uh, it's really amazing. It's just wonderful. Yeah. And thank you for my interruptions and the guys that are putting in my new counters. Oh. <laughs> Hannah, anything in closing? No, there have been some thank yous that have come through on the chat. And um, yeah. no, I have nothing more to add, but this has been so interesting and I learned so much today. So Deborah, thank you again. Oh, you're, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome. Quite, the, quite the resource for us. Oh, so you know, you. I'm here for you all if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank, thank Arlene. For, yes. I will, I will and, thank Arlene. Okay. I'll thank and tell her, her get healthy. I yes. will. I will. All Bye. right. Thank you Bye. so much. I'm going to end the Zoom. Thank you, everybody.